Okay, so let me just jump right into uh, the subject matter of Asia's regional architecture. And uh, I know this is a book launch of sorts, but uh, I'm not going to spend that much time talking about the book. Uh, you guys should go and read it, but I'll give you some context. <laughs> and, and there are 30% discounts for it. You can the order it here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, we don't get a cut. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no cut. I don't get, well, I think I get like a percent royalty, but that's not that's not the point. We're not here to make money. We're here to uh, exchange just ideas about uh, Asia and the Indo-Pacific. But um, but I am going to give a little bit of background, and then I want to talk about uh, the implications for uh, my argument about regional governance and also about Asian order. Uh, so let me just begin with the book and give you some context for the motivation of why I wrote this. So when I first started research on this topic in 2009, much of the academic international relations literature on Asian regionalism was produced by constructivist scholars, or scholars who looked, paid attention to ideas and identity. And they were really writing from the perspective of ASEAN or Southeast Asia. ASEAN, of course, was seen as the driver of Asian regionalism. And despite the persistence of historical antagonism, concerns about a rising China and political or potential flashpoints like the Korean Peninsula, constructivist scholars remain fairly optimistic about Asia's future. In a region once under-institutionalized, ASEAN norms of informality, non-intervention, and consensus building were encouraging policymakers to develop a wider East Asian community. So again, this, the slides aren't really that important, but these were the regional trends. If you think back to the 1990s, there was a lot of regional integration economically, uh, through production networks, through trade. We saw the development of, of regional institutions. Um, and there was this thinking that perhaps Cold War relics like bilateral US bilateral alliances would eventually give way to greater multilateralism. Now, these were the types of things that were coming out in the late 90s, uh, early mid 2000s. And so when I was looking at this in, in the late 2000s, I felt that this teleology, that somehow bilateralism <coughs> would be uh, replaced by multilateralism was wrong. My initial motivation was to challenge what I believe were overly optimistic interpretations of Asian regionalism. Of course, today, very few experts even constructivist scholars think the region is moving uh, closer towards integration, much less uh, an East Asian community. If you remember from ASEAN, they, they've talked much about, they've made much about the idea of an uh, East Asian community. The optimism of the early 2000s about regionalism has given way to general pessimism about the prospects of regional order. And I think a large part of this has to do with change perceptions about China's rise. Increasing Chinese assertiveness from the late 2000s has really dampened hopes for greater community building, particularly in East Asia. My own hunch about the region was also captured by realist scholars who questioned whether Asian regionalism was really much ado about nothing. Despite the relatively fast pace of Asian institu institution building since the 1990s, most of these institutions remained weak and redundant. So how many, if, if I were to ask, you know, how many people are familiar with the, the ASEAN plus three or the East Asia Summit or the Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat? I mean, those in this room who are Asia hands may know it, but for the general uh, audience or, or even students in my intro to IR class, they probably wouldn't have heard most of these uh, Asian institutions. But this development itself, this rapid pace of Asian institution building leads itself to another puzzle. Why would states create more institutions which are seen as weak and redundant? Moreover, how does this happen over time? How do we move from a region devoid of any institutions, save for the hub and spokes alliance system in ASEAN in the Cold War, to an alphabet soup of regional institutions formed in summits? So I know this is challenging your eyesight here, but the point is that this is not, this is a regional architecture in 1953, it's pretty much defined by uh, the hub and spokes alliance system. But by the time we get to the late, uh, to, to the mid 2000s or so, we see, uh, we see this development of institutions. 
It's this alphabet soup of regional initiatives, forums, and summits. Now, if I were to define regional architecture, it is a set of regional institutions, mechanisms, and arrangements that together provide necessary functions for a region. So Victor, who's not with us today, but has also written about alliances, has referred to Asia's regional architecture as a complex patchwork of bilateral, trilateral, minilateral, and multilateral institutions. I've described the regional architecture as a set of overlapping institutions. The academic literature on institutions refers to this phenomena as regime complexity, a term I use with my co-author, who's sitting in the uh, second row there. In a compare, when we compare Europe and Asia, you know, we, we use this term regime complexity. But regardless of what you want to call it, Asia's regional architecture has evolved through a process of institutional layering, a layering of, of, of a variety of institutions, bilateral, multilateral, bilateral, trilateral, multilateral. My book explains the evolution of Asia's regional architecture from 1945 to the present. It begins with the establishment of the hub and spoke system during the early Cold War period, and it ends by discussing China's efforts at institution building and U.S. attempts to shift its focus westward through the Indo-Pacific strategy. The book draws on a strand of social science research known as historical institutionalism, which basically argues that time and history matter. Institutional choices made earlier in time have a bearing on how policymakers make decisions and choose institutions later in time. There's a reason why bilateral alliances continue to persist today and why subsequent institutions are layered on top of bilateral alliances. Likewise, ASEAN carries a first mover advantage such that, such that subsequent institutions are built up or in conjunction with pre-existing institutions. So that's, that's the book in a nutshell, but uh, you know, much of this book is describing the development of Asia's regional architecture, but that leaves us with two so what questions that I want to focus on today that are relevant to policy. The first relates to questions of governance and whether overlapping institution, these overlapping institutions hinders or enhances regional cooperation. The second so what question addresses how the regional architecture relates to regional order and why alliances and institutions still matter, despite the beating liberal internationalism has taken from the Trump administration, and more recently from the likes of big IR scholars such as Stephen Wall and John Mearsheimer. So is the complex patchwork helpful for the region? So this is our first so what question. That is, do overlapping institutions actually enhance regional governance, cooperation, and security? There are three possible answers to this question. The first is they make no difference. Those skeptical of Asian institutions would argue that the prospects for stability and cooperation rest with some other factor, perhaps common interests or the balance of power. Asian institutions tend to be informal and weak and only matter in that common interests or power are channeled through that institutions. So in this case, institutions don't really make that much of a difference. The second answer would claim that over, <laughs> overlapping institutions do more harm than good. One claim is that regional institutions, such as the ASEAN Plus Three or the ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, just to name a few, are redundant and inefficient. Do we really need multiple institutions that cover many of the same issues? Although regional groupings provide space for dialogue and facilitate, work, uh, facilitate working groups, when the same issues are hashed and rehashed multiple times, one gets the feeling that participation in Asian institutions is frankly a waste of time. And for those in the policy making world here, I know you may not say it, but perhaps you think that uh, when you're over in Asia. So in fact, some US diplomats have argued in the past that ASEAN meetings are nothing more than a talk shop. Nothing ever gets accomplished in the end, and the same regional problems, from fishing rights to sustainable development to maritime security, never really get resolved. So the second, so there are really two points to this idea that no uh, 
overlapping institutions more, more harmful than uh, helpful for the region. And the second argument, in my opinion, is the more serious challenge, uh, and that's that overlapping institutions trigger rival regionalisms among major powers. And I'm always nervous talking about other people's work when they're sitting right in the front row, but Ellen Frost has written this terrific report for MBR on rival regionalisms. And her argument suggests an alternative, albeit what I would see as a realist explanation for overlapping institutions um, compared to my own. The short version of her thesis is that states compete for regional influence by creating institutions which support their own ambitions. This is an extension of balance of power politics, played out in the realm of institutions as major powers such as the United States, China, and Russia, as well as middle and smaller powers such as Japan or ASEAN, all elevate their preferred institutions. If Beijing doesn't like an ins the institutional order, then it can create its own set of institutions, the AIIB, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Shenzhen Forum, and it can use those to address its interests. There's a reason why Beijing tends to elevate institutions which exclude the United States China's early preference for the ASEAN plus three over the East Asia summit is well noted uh, because the ASEAN plus three doesn't have uh, the United States or really any uh, Anglo countries. If China doesn't like the TPP, then it can support uh, RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So overlapping institutions reflect existing power struggles and worse, they may actually exacerbate competition. Okay, the third response to this question of whether overlapping institutions enhance security, governance, and cooperation uh, is, is a yes, it's a positive answer. And that's that overlapping institutions improve uh, cooperation and, and things like global governance, even if they don't directly solve those problems. And I can offer three benefits related to overlapping institutions for the region and for Asian actors. Uh, first is it's, it's relatively easy to participate, to engage in the regional architecture. The complex patchwork of institutions makes participating in regional institutions uh, easy because the states have many options that require few upfront participation costs. If certain policymakers feel that the East Asia Summit is too large to produce anything meaningful, <laughs> they can then work through the ASEAN plus three. But in the meantime, they can maintain membership uh, in both institutions. So if the option is to, you have to choose one or you remain outside of the regional architecture or if you uh, have multiple options, it makes it easier to participate when there's uh, several institutions. If you want to coordinate on sub-regional issues, uh, you can actively participate in organizations like the South Asian uh, Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC. Uh, or uh, for Northeast Asia, you have the Trilateral Summit with the China, Japan, Korea, Trilateral, Secre uh, uh, Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat. So there are various uh, sub-regional sub -regional organizations that you can uh, participate in. The second advantage is that this is really for small and, and middle powers. Uh, overlapping regionalism gives states, particularly smaller powers, greater strategic flexibility and choice. And this uh, relates to the first point as well. A participation in multiple regional institutions has enabled smaller states, such as Singapore, Singapore, to really punch above their weight by giving them additional <clears throat> voice on regional issues. And, and the last point I'll make about the advantage of overlapping institutions is just face time. Uh, the overlapping nature of Asian regionalism has increased opportunities for face-to-face -face interaction between policymakers. <laughs> Now, I'm going to be realistic. Just because uh, policymakers and heads of states happen to gather together, this doesn't necessarily resolve, uh, resolve problems. There's still plenty of problems and, and competition that exist within the region. But, these, uh, but repeating interaction at times can shape expectations and norms for regional actors. And large multilateral fora, these big summits uh, that happen in East Asia, do provide opportunities for smaller gatherings that themselves can become institutionalized over time. I can give the example of China, Japan, the China-Japan Create Trilateral Summit. It began as a breakfast meeting on the sidelines of the ASEAN plus three. And then the plus three countries, China, Japan, Korea, decided to uh, meet on their own uh, over breakfast. And then over a few years, they decided to institutionalize this. So there is some 
uh, some form of institutional cooperation that can emerge uh, when you have uh, these overlapping institutions. So in sum, overlapping institutions can encourage positive rather than zero-sum solutions to regional problems. They also make it much harder for any single power to rewrite the rules of regional order unless there is strong buy-in from other countries. And of course, I'm thinking about China here. If the alternative to over-institutionalization is an under-institutionalized Asia or a region filled with non-overlapping institutions demarcated by the rigid lines of geopolitical interest, I would place my bet on the complex patchwork. Okay, let me move on now to the second so what question, and this really has to do uh, with the future of, of Asian order. <coughs> the final area I address is this relationship between regional architecture and Asian order. So this is actually draws from some of the insights I have in, in the last chapter of my book in the conclusion. <clears throat> but this is also where the rise of China and the Indo-Pacific strategy comes to the forefront, and where I make the strong case for US engagement in Asia's regional architecture. A central question preoccupying scholars and policymakers alike is whether a more powerful, confident China will accept existing institutional arrangements which underpin Asian order, or whether, China, or whether Chinese participation in these institutions will uh, lead to a rewriting of the rules of the game that were originally conceived by, by the West, ASEAN, and some of these other players. In the early 1990s, China was initially a reluctant participant of Asian multilateralism. Under the concept of cooperative security, however, Beijing began to accept multilateral institutions as a means of measure, uh, it's a means of reassuring neighbors and promoting dialogue and confidence building. So, in the early 1990s, we do see China um, beginning to um, to dabble with multilateralism. Well, today, China is actively engaged participating in many of the region's most significant forms and institutions. China's imprint on Asia's regional architecture continues to grow as it launches new regional initiatives around its interests. Regardless of where one stands on China's newfound regional activity, a few general observations can be made about Beijing's role in shaping Asia's regional architecture, and by extension, shaping that regional order. First, China has become increasingly active in supporting multilateral processes. Regional and global governance are now central to Chinese foreign policy thinking in response to an array of challenges, including climate change, international peacekeeping, anti-piracy, disaster relief, economic governance, economic governance, development aid, and energy security. So China is uh, much more active these days. The second observation is that China has demonstrated its preference for regional institutions where it can maximize its, where it can maximize its influence. And I've already uh, mentioned this, but in practice, this means Beijing tends to favor institutions in which the United States remains absent. And third, Beijing's approach to multilater multilateralism has taken on a much more strategic dimension under Xi Jinping's leadership. In the past, China's participation in regional institutions were more likely to be perceived as signaling its peaceful rise in development. Since the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, however, China has been more intentional in linking its regional initiatives to broader strategic aims. Moreover, China's ability to reshape the regional architecture has become much more real. This was seen during Xi Jinping's speech in 2014 at the Conference, uh, conference for Interaction uh, and confidence building in Asia, the CICA, where he made this reference to outdated Cold War alliances and called for a, quote, new regional security cooperation architecture for Asians. And it's also uh, reflected in his comments at the 19th Party Congress in 2017. Beijing will surely fill the void if the U.S. and its allies become less present in the region's institutional architecture. This is how China has managed to build inroads rapidly in Central and South Asia. 
both literally and figuratively. Washington is now playing catch up, responding to China's westward shift with its Indo-Pacific strategy. A decoupling of US bilateral alliances or Washington's disengagement from multilateral institutions would further encourage China to establish its preferred vision of regional order, one perhaps more authoritarian and less transparent in character. The future of Asian order is at stake. The prospects of order transition, whether regionally or globally, has accelerated under the Trump presidency over concerns that the US has abdicated its leadership in global affairs. Under the tongue-in-cheek title, Make China Great Again, Evan Osnos in The New Yorker writes, and this is his quote, as Donald Trump surrenders America's global commitments, Xi Jinping is learning to pick up the pieces. Australian scholar Andrew Phillips states that China is quote, skillfully exploiting American introversion, pursuing a grand strategy that seeks to ease out and ultimately displace America as Asia's dominant power, unquote. Order involves the legitimization of rules, norms, and institutions. If the United States desires to shape, not merely react to shifts in regional order, then it must act to cultivate alliances, lead multilateral institutions, and encourage like-minded partners to invest in the region's institutional architecture. A modified liberal order still provides the best option for enhancing US national interests and that of like-minded actors. The region would still rely on bilateral alliances and multilateral institutions to provide stability and promote regional governance, but with hopefully increasing buy-in from China and other non-democratic or quasi-democratic countries that are only loosely connected to the regional architecture right now. So how liberal this order will look may depend on the degree to which Beijing supports or undercuts regional institutions designed to support norms such as sovereignty, human rights, and non-proliferation. A decade earlier, Princeton professor John Eikenberry suggested that it would be easier for China to join <laughs> than overturn the liberal international order. That idea is now being contested, particularly at the Pacific <laughs> regions, where China has a much stronger claim and stake in reshaping Asian order. The challenge is more acute today, not only because of China's increased capabilities and ambitions, but also because the institutions which have propped regional order for decades now are also being challenged from within, right here within the United States. In this vein, President Trump is right to probe traditional institutional arrangements and defense commitments in Asia, especially if existing policies do not enhance U.S. interests or address regional problems. Trump's public lashing against allies regarding alliance costs also likely contributed to recent increases in alliance spending. However, reduced Reducing allied relationships to transactions doesn't help Washington's cause in leading, much less sustaining an institutional architecture which aims to support a free and open order. And that's the Trump administration's phrasing, free and open Indo-Pacific. <clears throat> Critics such as Stephen Wall believe that liberal internationalism's perpetual foothold in Washington has, quote, uh, weakened the country and caused considerable harm at home and abroad. End quote. This has not been the case or the experience of Asia. One set of institutions which has outlived all others in the post-war Asian regional order is the U.S. anchored bilateral alliance system. Underpinned by strong domestic a strong domestic consensus, alliances have maintained their flexibility and robustness even as threat levels have varied across different decades. Since the end of the Cold War, the region has also witnessed a web of interconnected institutions and security networks which revolve around the core hub and spoke system, as well as ASEAN and its family of institutions. Bilateral alliances, which sit at the core of Asia's regional architecture, provides a degree of stability to the region, even as historical antagonism and power balancing dynamics continue to threaten the peace. Along with multilateral institutions, they address regional governance, issues from disaster relief to nuclear interdiction. 
As such, Asia's regional architecture should not be treated as a zero-sum game where rival powers build new institutions to balance against others. This is where broader engagement with regional institutions can serve U.S. interests without giving Beijing the impression that its actions in the Indo-Pacific are aimed at containing China. Robust engagement with alliances and institutions would also make it much harder for governments to develop rules, norms, and institutions supporting an illiberal order. Finally, encouraging Asian countries to invest in the region's institutional architecture, whether through increased financial and military support for U.S. alliances, or by engaging in multilateral <coughs> institutions promoting cooperation and security, helps wean free riders from U.S. dependence, something that the Trump administration has talked about repeatedly, but it also still gives the United States leverage to shape the regional order. So in sum, I'm making a case for active engagement with Asia's regional architecture from the U.S. side, and this isn't what we're really seeing uh, necessarily from the Trump administration. There's a gap, I think, between uh, rhetoric uh, and actions, but there is this concern that if we um, that that if we disengage, that that could have uh, negative repercussions for the future of Asian order. Um, I'm, so I'm going to stop right there. I, I think Sati may have a couple of questions or comments, and then we can open it up for question and answer. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. That was a terrific overview, and I, again, encourage you to take advantage of the 30% discount and uh, order the book today. <laughs> order before the night. Uh, no, look, uh, you, you've put so much on the table, I'm not going to even pretend that we didn't know Victor was coming until an hour or two ago, so... I certainly haven't been able to go through your book, but a couple of um, really big things sort of jumped out of in just your presentation. Um, one was, you know, this comes up a lot in the region. I'm surprised in the region how little emphasis there is on institutions. Uh, in other words, the Asian demand for these institutions or expectations of them strike me sometimes as less than we might have here in the U.S. Um, they tend to rely on bilaterals. They tend to rely on national resilience, other things. They find them useful. Um, and especially given what they said ASEAN in the last few years, I think there's even, even more of a sense as I go out in the region about wondering how useful they can be. So one question was just, do we expect too much of them? Um, I must say, I have been somewhat surprised that this administration, at least in Asia, quite apart from global institutions, has been very committed to going out to ASEAN, engaging in APEC. We, we may quibble about it's the right engagement, et cetera, but they, they haven't dismissed these institutions. In fact, they've been repeatedly in rhetoric and in mostly in visits um, mm -hmm attended APEC, attended EAS, etc. So that was a, a second observation. The other thing I, I just wondered is, what about the countries that we... I'll come back to that. Let me, let me, let me, let me stop there on that. The other one is um, about uh, a question I had about um, countries in the region using these institutions. I was thinking not of Singapore, which allows flexibility. I was thinking about India. Here it is at the global institutional level, a UN member, but also a member of Chinese institutions like BRICS and AIB, but also in the EAS, and simultaneously improving relations with the US at a bilateral level. So in other words, it seems to me people are very, um, uh, countries are very um, adaptive in using these institutions to pursue national interests. Mm -hmm. Do they have to make a choice between any of these things? I mean, it seems to me that one of the points of your book is that this complex patchwork really serves national interests very well. Everyone can pick and choose bits and pieces to advance national agendas without having to make a choice. Do you foresee a point at which countries will have to make a choice between rival regionalism, like mm -hmm. you have to choose one or the other, or one relationship or another? That's what keeps coming up in the discourse mm -hmm. in the region. Right. So let me let me leave it there. I mean, I just wanted to sure. a couple things that jumped out of me. You don't have to answer them now, but I just want to point out to everyone because we are live streaming. We may get questions um, 
Are we getting questions via Twitter? No. Karen? No, we're not. Okay. So everyone in this room is invited to ask questions. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether we were going to get emails or Twitter questions. So it's 1235. We have to 130 sharp. So let me just open it up. Please, why don't you introduce yourself, your affiliation, start, and then pose a question. Hi, my name is Talan Choi from the Montgomery College. I'm a student mm -hmm. of the Montgomery College. Uh, I have one question. So, okay, so after the president Moon uh, became the president of mm -hmm. the South Korea, the South Korea, they, uh, the current uh, Korean government, they changed their foreign policy toward the, 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 uh, the ASEAN community to, to uh, increase more popular. The, Cooperation between South Korea and the, the Asian countries. So, but the, I think that depending on the, the political leader or the administration, the the foreign policy for the Asian country are are uh, completely changing. Mm -hmm. So, the, I wonder that if the ASEAN ASEAN is capable of the uh, the reacting of uh, uh, giving the response to uh, the depending on the. Uh, external external the foreign policy of the other countries mm -hmm. and then i also have another question uh the, what is the leader uh leader country the leading country of the asia the asia, asia community because for example in european union the germany is playing a lot role of the leader country within the Euro, uh, european mm -hmm. union so yeah. leading country of asean and is asean capable of responding Sure, uh, very good questions. And I'll get to Sati, uh, your questions, yeah, sure. which are kind of bigger picture yeah, sure, sure. Uh, type questions. But it, uh, the, on the second question, in terms of who leads ASEAN, uh, officially, you know, ASEAN has a rotating chair, so it's a different it's a different ASEAN country each year that leads the ASEAN um, ministerial meeting. But in terms of kind of political clout or who, who drives the organization, I think Indonesia may be one of the key players. Uh, the Secretariat is in Jakarta, um, but other active uh, countries have been, you know, Malaysia, I think Singapore at times plays an important role, uh, and also Thailand, but I'd say Indonesia, is, it's the largest country as well too, but they, uh, and because the Secretariat is based there, I would say that they, um, they carry political clout, excuse me. Uh, but that said, you know, I, I think the last time I was at a talk here was when uh, our friend of Yuan Chang was sure. talking about ASEAN. He was just really critical. So they, they, can't, they can't get their act together. It's sort of a, a leaderless, rudderless organization kind of flailing around. And I, I think that might be an extreme uh, characterization, but I would say probably Indonesia. And in terms of your point about you know being able to You know, engage with these institutions, especially for ASEAN. They they require counterparts who also want to work with ASEAN. And, and right now in South Korea, Bun Jae-in has uh, he's come up with this new uh, Southern policy, which orients his foreign policy towards Southeast Asia and South Asia. So there's uh, a lot of uh, opportunities because there's political will uh, from the president. And it was the same way in the in the mid uh, late 2000s. The Japanese were very keen in regionalism. Our regional institutions, and so that allows for a lot of cooperation, even with the Obama administration in uh, developing ties with ASEAN in 2009. So I think you're absolutely correct. Domestic politics plays um, a part in enhancing um, regional institution building. Um, but that said, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, at, at any given time, you could say that the stars all have to align, that all, all the domestic politics have to align in a way that can make uh, regionalism, uh, regional institution building move forward. But but at the same time, I think these processes kind of have uh, th their own kind of institutional logic. There is institutional inertia so that even if the domestic political wealth isn't there, um, these institutions continue to persist. And they, they wax and wane, and I think that might, be, that might be what we're seeing right now with the United States. So I think the Trump administration, as you mentioned, has, you know, at least rhetorically, talked about ASEAN multilateralism. They showed they showed up they showed up for meetings. It wasn't the president, so it was a step down. Um, but perhaps in the next administration things might heat up again if you have someone in power, someone within the domestic political um, realm that, that really wants to make a case for um, Asian regionalism. Well, we've got several hands, so let me try to go through them. Priscilla, please would you introduce yourself and um, Priscilla Clapp. 
I'm a um, retired Foreign Service officer, but I'm at USIP right now. Um, following up on your ASEAN comments, I've had quite a bit of experience with ASEAN, having served in Burma, Myanmar. Um, and I would argue that ASEAN is really two different kind of animals. Uh, it, its members are so diverse that you could never expect to get much unified um, uh, action out of, out of ASEAN. And I think that people who criticize ASEAN tend to be frustrated that it doesn't act like a nation state. It can't. But it does provide enormous convening power, and it's the only organization in the region that brings everybody together. It has, when, when you have an ASEAN summit, every member, every uh, country in the region can attend. They don't with the other regional organizations. Um, and even though people criticize it as a talk shop, that talk is actually very important within the region for understanding. I would argue that ASEAN has had more influence on, well, it has a lot of influence among its members, because, and, but it's done very quietly and it's done in different ways. I mean, all of this talking actually does focus on some of the region's problems, but they do it in a quiet way purposely to keep the great powers out of it. Um, and they had a lot of influence on, on Myanmar over the last 20 years, more than, than anyone else. And they had it because they're not a great power, because they're a friendly neighbor, and, and that's the sort of thing the leadership, whether it's military or civilian, listens to in Myanmar. And I think it's true of other ASEAN countries as well. So I would, I would argue that ASEAN deserves much deeper scrutiny at an academic level as, as an institutional organization because it's unique and I think it's actually quite effective for what it is. Thanks for your comments. I'm actually, I'm actually in agreement. Uh, so the characterization that it doesn't really matter or that it's more harmful, those were to the alternatives, but I'm also on the same page that I actually think that it is, it does play, uh, play some constructive role for regional dynamics and absolutely it's because of- And ASEAN. balance. It, right. It knows how to balance power in the region, and that's why it was founded. Right. Good. Thanks for your comments. Please, here. Um, me? Yes, please. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah King from uh, Radio Beijing. Um, so, um, regarding the Northeast um, Asian countries' policy on North Korea, so because every uh, country has their own different interests, and so how do you um, picture the Northeast Asian region um, currently, I mean, after a few summits between South and North Korea and in China and North Korea, and um, or in the near future, mm -hmm. when it comes to the um, the policy or the relations between those countries on North Korea. Sure. I mean, so Northeast Asia is a really, uh, I mean, it's it's been contested for over a century because there are different powers that are vying for uh, political influence and. Today, I feel like because so much has been overtaken by the summits, the inter-Korea summits with the U.S. Uh, North Korea summit, that that has really been the driving focus of, of Northeast Asia and not, I mean, if we go back to the era of the six-party talks, there was discussion of creating a mechanism for Northeast Asia, you know, peace and cooperation. I think South Korea, under the previous government, tried to pick that up with NAFC. Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative. Now other countries have tried to promote something that could um, uh, allow for dialogue in Northeast Asia, but I think because so much uh, focus and capital has been spent on just North Korea itself that we haven't really thought about those mechanisms. Everything has been dealt with you know, directly with North Korea, you know, China, North Korea, Russia, North Korea. Um, and it'd be good actually to, to step back and get back to some kind of more political form that you can actually discuss North Korea, but I think uh, the great the U.S. included, you know, the, the larger powers aren't really prepared for that at that moment. Just a quick follow-up question. Please. Do you, um, you know, recently uh, there was um, uh, something between Russia and North Korea, yes. and then Putin actually suggests a six-party talk. And then, do you do you think that's a um, good idea? Well, he didn't. He didn't suggest it. He well, he said that he, he would be open to that. I, it, I, I read different interpretations of what he meant by that. I mean, at some point, you're going to have to involve all parties. So maybe not 
right away that they're going to have this you know six party multilateral forum. But uh, it's it's really the North Koreans because I don't think the North Koreans have any care for that. They want to deal directly with um, the U.S. Uh, but if things, if the ball gets rolling, then perhaps there might be a room to convene the other powers, because I think every one of those uh, six countries have a stake in what happens on the Korean Peninsula. I don't want to be accused of being a rightist, so I'm going to take a couple questions over here and balance things out in bipartisanship here. Please, sir. Yes. My name back. is uh, C.J. Park, business uh, of with uh, the aspect of uh, population and the financial debt, Chinese status is not so good. Mm -hmm. If uh, Chinese power, if decreased, uh, decreased, mm -hmm. and then if another thing, yes. U.S. draw back their military troops from East, Northeast Asia, at that time, what do you think about the situation, the future of Asian border? Is that to be a jungle or beautiful garden? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I like your analogy. So it's so just to recap, it's an order where uh, China has been weakened um, and the United States has scaled back um, its presence. And so I think the assumption in your argument is that there's going to be some kind of power vacuum political void because the U.S. and China um, are less present. I mean, there's some that would argue, if you take the beautiful garden analogy, that finally Asian states, countries within the region can kind of set their own goals and policy without interference from outside great powers. But um, in that sense, I, I mean, I see the world in a bit more of a realist lens, and I feel like someone uh, someone else may try to uh, dominate the scene. It could be a Russia, it could be India. Uh, you could see some kind of multipolar, um, multipolar dynamic. And uh, I know, I mean, I have uh, different arguments about the role that the US military presence plays uh, in Asia, but it's interesting that even though China has been, is critical about alliances and wants to use that, a part of me thinks that when, I, when we talk with Chinese scholars, that they they think that at least there's a useful purpose for it that keeps Japan uh, at bay. It's uh, someone had phrased it as the United States is the least distrusted actor in East Asia. There's still historical antagonism that that bears into mind within this region, and so um, I mean I think if that were the case, I mean it, we, we can't predict the future. I mean I think that there could be more problems, and so. Uh, yeah, I would say that it would be more problematic than, than perhaps helpful. One more on this side, then I'll come back. Yes, Miss. Hello, Chen Christiana from Waseda University, Japan. Um, my question is, you address about the Cold War where, where the Soviet Union is still like active in the, uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. How do you see the shift um, from that period until Resent, I mean, like the Russian rules in Asia itself. And my second question is more into about the specifically about the security um, alliance. Uh, as we know now, um, there is a quad, uh, squad uh, security dialogues. How do you see it in the near future? It's going to be developed uh, more, uh, have a more rules or stuff. Right. So, uh I didn't quite catch the first question. The second question on the quad, though, um, I do think that it's going to play more of a role. I think the Trump administration is trying to do more with it. I mean, this is something that the Japanese have talked about even before the Trump administration. And it's because you have this narrative of a free and open, um, they call it free and open in the Pacific. So what's it mean to be free and open? And at least with these four, uh, four countries, India, Japan, Australia, United States, you can argue that they're democracies and that they have a, a vested interest in, in openness, uh, in transparency. And so even from a symbolic point of view, I think the U.S. would see it as useful to try to develop um, to develop the quad. So, I, so it probably will play a bigger role um, moving forward as long as we still stick with this uh, Indo-Pacific narrative. I'm actually not all that assured that it's going to stick around beyond the Trump administration, but, but that's another debate. That, 
Okay. It's just harder to grasp around conceptually, uh, I think. And your first question was about the Soviet Union, and then yeah, I mean the Russia rules in Asia, the chains of Russia. Oh, I just can't help but mention uh, <laughs> next week Angela Stent, uh, who's the director, uh, <laughs> professor of government at Foreign Service School at Georgetown, and her new book on Putin's world. We'll be here speaking, and prior to that, we'll be releasing a set of six or seven pieces by Russian experts from Russian institutions on what they think their role is in Asia, including with bilateral countries. So, if you're not on our Asia Pacific bulletin um, uh, list, sir, you could uh, be, you're, sorry. you're a great salesman. <laughs> <laughs> I get paid to market, my friend. So, please. Um, so, the Soviet Union was the Cold War period was when I was set up in a way so that the Soviet Union was uh, involved, but it was, it was involved in things like triangle politics between China and the US, the Soviet Union. There were border conflicts that the Soviet Union had with India, with Vietnam, but it wasn't really part of the institutional landscape. So there is this bias when I talk about the regional architecture in the Cold War, and I say that's set up by the hub and spokes alliance. It's really uh, those that are within kind of the US, uh, US orbit. It wasn't a part of ASEAN. it wasn't part of the bilateral alliance system. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't a player uh, in Asia. Um, I think the transition from Cold War to post-Cold War, the Russians, um, I think in some ways they've been neglected for a couple of decades. And so now we see them getting back into the game, particularly within Central Asia. And I think this is where we see uh, increasing relevance of Russia and Russian interest. Uh, I mentioned in my talk that the shift has been moving westward, where there was a lot of focus, especially in the Cold War on East Asia, Northeast Asia in particular. Um, you know, everyone was talking about uh, Central Asia. There are all these initiatives for Southeast Asia and South Asia. And that's certainly, um, if you're talking about Central Asia, that's really Russia's backyard. These are former Soviet republics. And so I do think that Russia is going to try to play more of a role. And we already see that with Russia and North Korea. Um, the discussions between uh, Russia and South Korea as well, too, and, and connecting it into Korea Railroad. And I do think Russia is going to try to be playing a bigger uh, bigger role in, in Asian politics. Let's go to this side, Steve. Uh, Steve Winter is an independent consultant. I, I like, maybe this is a follow up on that uh, mention of transparency there. Uh, uh, you, you present this uh, contrast between illiberal, authoritarian, non transparent on one side and liberal, transparent, so forth and so on, which, which is pretty uh, standard here. However, uh, I've been wondering, for example, the, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Japan spoke here just a few days ago, Suzuki San, and uh, he was responding to a, the criticism that you hear sometimes now that Japan is somehow cozying up to the Belt and Road after Abe's mm -hmm. trip to Beijing. Uh, as opposed to what they were doing three or four years ago, which was seem to be direct uh, mm -hmm. attempt to circumvent that project. And and what he said was, he said, well, in this three or four year period, actually the Chinese have moved towards us as well, in the sense that they're becoming more transparent in the in the in the projects that they propose for the Belt and Road. So therefore, there be, it's it's better. We are more able to work with them now than we would have been before because they're actually getting more transparent. Similarly, with uh, Xi Jinping, this, this uh, presentation at the Belt and Road mm -hmm. Forum just a few days ago, same thing, that they're going to be more transparent. Uh, and finally, leading to Putin's comment a couple of days ago that, ironically, uh, uh, Xi Jinping seems to be emerging as, as the uh, champion of the liberal world Openness, order. Yes. So uh -huh. the issue is, it's, it, you can see that, uh, at least from certain quarters, there's a real question of whether you can marry non-transparent and authoritarian in the way we assume we can. In other words, so would you conceive the possibility that, that you could have a much more transparent, but yet still very authoritarian, or even more authoritarian and more transparent order coming from Japan? <laughs> um, that That's a really interesting question. I mean, for me, I, and if I go back to just the implications of, of the complex patchwork, I mean, I, uh, I mean the hope is really that you see uh, authoritarian countries, those that are illiberal, kind of seeing that it's actually beneficial for them to be more open, to be more transparent. I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative, that's, uh, China is running into a lot of problems with that already. And so it could be a, I mean, it could be a learning, a 
it, it's probably a sharp learning curve, but uh, they might see that maybe it is better to be a bit more transparent so that we don't lose all our money in these investments and never get it back. And I mean, right now they're trying, you know, they just raise, you know, interest rates. And uh, I mean, now these countries like Pakistan or Sri Lanka are indebted to China, but, um, but there are, it's not like, it's not that China hasn't run into any problems. And so it may be helpful to actually learn from the Japanese or learn from the U.S. Um, how to how to do infrastructure development? I mean, one thing that you know people have been talking about is the AIB. There is all this uh, fear that AIB <laughs> would replace other multilateral uh, lending uh, development banks like the World Bank or the Asia Development Bank. Uh, I don't think Japan and the United States still aren't aren't uh, members of this, but I know that the AIB partnered together with the World Bank. Um, not with the ADB, they may have done some work with the IMF uh, in in uh, in their projects, and so this is a way for I think Chinese policymakers to understand how uh, what the norms, what the um, what what kind of the international standards are for for these lending practices. So that doesn't mean that I mean I think your question is well, does that mean that? Chinese government is going to become more open. No, it's probably going to still remain authoritarian. Russia will remain authoritarian. But in terms of regional governance, global governance, this is actually a good thing. So it's so you have to almost disaggregate. Well, these are these are authoritarian states. It doesn't mean that we can't do business with them or we can't work with them. I mean, the U.S. works with autocrats all the time, so it shouldn't be a problem. So you're back um, to Marisimer, who you seem to dissociate yourself with earlier. <laughs> no, but 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 I'm saying, but in, the question is really about regional governance. Does the regional architecture uh, enhance uh, cooperation um, and governance? And, and I think the answer can be yes. <laughs> uh, Bella, in the back, and then we'll come back to this. So, my name is Chan Pili, or Bella. I'm a visiting fellow here at the East of Central in Washington, mm -hmm. and also a PhD candidate at the University of Antwerp. So, my question is you know, if you compare to ASEAN and other ASEAN Central institutions, such as uh, ASEAN Regional Forum and East Asia Summit, then do you think that ASEAN Plus 3 is doing a better job or the a worse job in addressing the regional, you know, regional issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it's so, then you know, the, whether that you know, is performance you have anything to do with you know, the, the plus 3 countries? Sure. It, it's hard to make those assessments um, of what is better or worse among the institutions uh, without really kind of measuring what the outputs are. I do know that with ASEAN Regional Forum that there has been a lot of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong if anyone works in this in this space, but it's been there's been more disappointment with it from what from its initial um, startup. I know Japan, for instance, has not. They were really keen in the ASEAN Regional Forum at the early stages, but it didn't really uh, amount. It, it, I mean, it's a it's a way for the foreign ministers uh, to get together to talk about various um, security issues, but but it's it, it's a forum. And these days, I would see something like the Shangri La Dialogue, um, which is run by IISS, as being probably more effective or getting more attention or gravitas in the ASEAN regional forum. But again, correct me if I'm wrong, because it, that might be just my view as an academic and not as someone who works on policy area. But on the ASEAN plus three, the ASEAN plus three tends to orient more towards uh, economic and financial issues. And um, I think that there was a period where many thought that that was the building block for East Asian regionalism. But once the East Asia summit uh, got underway, uh, there is this whole debate between um, an East Asian form of regionalism versus an Asia Pacific form of regionalism. And um, the United States had really tried, especially under the Obama administration, really tried to promote the East Asia summit. I think that may have taken some of the thunder out of ASEAN plus three. But then again, the United States isn't really uh, a party to ASEAN plus three. So uh, the vantage point from a, a Chinese or a South Korean or um, so, uh, or in one of the plus three countries, it may be different. They may see ASEAN plus three still being um, useful. I mean, ASEAN plus three is really useful in the sense that after the Asian financial crisis, it provided some sort of mechanisms for uh, countries within the region to address um, any future sort of uh, ec 
economic you know, financial crises. Um, so to that extent, it's, it's playing that role. But they've tried to break out the ASEAN plus three to address all sorts of issues beyond economics. Um, uh, and, and that's where I think it hasn't really been as successful because there's so many other organizations in this place. There's a question on this side. Yes, please. Then. Uh, I'm Linda Yard, George Washington Linda. University. Hi, terrific talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, whether there's any kind of emergence of, you know, beyond the insti these institutional architectures, a kind of regional mindset among young people. Yeah, as you know, in, in Europe, the Bologna process and Erasmus you know, led to extensive mobility among universities, and young people do have a different sense of, of being um, European, at least those who have taken advantage of these opportunities. I know there's an, there's an ASEAN university network but of some sort, but it, has it what has it accomplished, and, right. and is there any sense of a burgeoning uh, regional mindset among you? Is there any polling data or anything on the ASEAN sense of, That's you know, there's question. the um, Weiss Healy program and others, but do they have a sense of being so, members of ASEAN? So there's ASEAN, and then also, I'm most familiar with the China-Japan-Korea cooperation, and the, the cooperation secretary has advanced all these, you know, exchanges in sports and education and kind of youth dialogue and getting uh, young Japanese and Koreans and Chinese together to try to understand you know, where where the other comes from and their views about um, you know, politics and history. And you know when you spend time or and, and I know you you do as well too because you work in a lot of in that space, um, you feel optimistic and hopeful, but then you read the headlines of what's going on and you wonder, well, does it make any sort of difference? And the, and the puzzle has always been, how does this translate from kind of the people at the people level among you know, the younger generation, where it, it seems like they could kind of break out as well and have a better understanding of the other, uh, and then translate that up to the, national, the, the level of uh, kind of national interest. And, um, I mean, sadly, I, I would—I would just my kind of gut hunch is that we haven't really seen that uh, make that that much of an event. I just remember from Ian's uh, work when he was doing ASEAN. The argument is that there is no ASEAN identity; that it's um, that it's yeah. You know, people will associate with you know, you're, it's a fellow Southeast Asian, but you know, what does? And Thailand have in common with, with Myanmar uh, versus the Philippines. And so there's there's a debate even among scholars about whether there is an ASEAN identity. And Europe is the same way too. They've done studies of is what's it mean to be a European or have a European national identity. There have been polls and surveys on this, but I don't know how that translates into um, government policy, especially as we see the year uh, you know, the EU you know, unraveling. So. So one more back there. Yes, sir. I didn't see you earlier. Please. Go ahead. Uh, guys can tell me. Uh, George Washington University. I can see you again. And well, my question is on the modified liberal order mm -hmm. that you had in the last slide. Uh, could you elaborate a little more what you mean by that? And like what specific sort of sure. modifications so, do you So in my art, so I had it in my talk, but I I thought it would. I tried to execute the 30 minutes, but I assumed that Victor would come. But there's a modified liberal order, but the al other alternative is one that's like a China dominated order. And another one is where um, it's akin to, I guess, Amitabh Acharya's argument about a multiplex mm. order, where it's no, it's really no one's order, that they're different within a region, there are multiple countries that kind of interact and work together, but there isn't um, a specific pool. So those are the you know, three scenarios or the options for Asia. Asia order, and I say that I say modified liberal order because uh, I think that liberal hegemony, and so this is going back to the, the bigger debates about liberal internationalism and what sort of grand strategy should the U.S. Um, uh, adopt. Uh, there's been arguments that the lib this idea of liberal hegemony has gotten the U.S. into too much trouble. That you know, things like democracy promotion, intervention, um, that that's been bad. Uh, for the U.S. I don't want to say that's been uh, all bad. You can point to examples that certainly show uh, the folly of, of 
<laughs> going is, is uh, complex without understanding the consequences. But um, but it's modified in the sense that you have to allow space for other actors to join it, and that means um, negotiating with other countries, negotiating what what the new norms are, what the institutional boundaries are going to be. And so, in a modified order, I I would argue that it means uh, in practice it means letting China have a bit more say and buy in and how these how these rules um, how these rules are written uh, uh, for order and governance. So that's what I mean by modified uh, liberal order. But the core of it, you know, relying on multilateral institutions, having things like bilateral alliances, those things are still central to this order. Was there one on the right? Oh, let me get Eddie and then we'll be sure. Eddie? Yeah, I'm Eddie, Eddie Litchie, I'm a retired journalist. I wonder whether your analysis distinguishes between the rules based institutions like uh, the TPP, or rather CP, TPP right now, uh, and uh, the, I would call quasi-institutions like like the, the grid, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, it's kind of a club of some, but it, I mean, it's getting institutional uh, gravitas in the sense that it holds annual meetings. The same thing with the BOA National Forum, which is the annual event held in Hainan. It gets tremendous uh, attendance. All the ASEAN countries attend it. And I guess the question is, how would you uh, assess the, the effectivity of those rules-based institutions? Like, for instance, whatever happened to RCEP, for instance? <coughs> I, I've, I've never heard of, I haven't heard of RCEP in a long, long time. These are rules supposed to be rules-based. And with Japan as the leader of uh, TPP, how do you assess its, uh, its success in holding TPP together in the sense that uh, Japan is not a, uh, a net exporting, a net importing country like the U.S. is. Mm -hmm. And that's why the U.S. was an attractive leader of the TPP because countries like Vietnam, for instance, expected to import more to to um, the United States, whereas Japan is a net importing, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, net exporting country. So it doesn't have the same pizzas mm -hmm. that the United States has. So how would you assess all that? So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what the question part is, but if you're asking about you know, TPP versus RCEP and you know, what this means for different actors in the region, I mean, RCEP is still around. I mean, the Chinese, I think when Japan was kind of negotiating the CTP, CPTPP, um, the TPP 11. Um, I remember China was also talking about the RCEP and there was, they had convened some sort of meeting. And the difference is that you know, TPP, CPTPP is supposed to be a high quality you know, kind of trade agreement that, that's based on you know, kind of strict standards. And, and the RCEP is more of, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a trade, it's a multilateral trade agreement, but it's, <coughs> kind of a, a lowest common denominator uh, approach. And for states, they can, you know, someone, it goes back to your question of do states have to choose one or another? If you're you know, Malaysia, why would you choose? Why would you, yeah, if you're Vietnam, why would you choose? Just join both of them. Um, so, uh, so I think all these things are in place. I, I think the Japanese have actually done a tremendous job in getting this. I mean, even though the US, the US was the biggest backer the TPP and for them to pull out was, you could have said that this whole thing is going to unravel and it's going to kind of flop, but the Japanese have really uh, taken the, the leadership on and I think this is going to move forward with or without, it is moving forward with uh, without the U.S. And um, so so in, in terms of trade architecture, I mean, I think you can have these, there's, there's, there's also the FTAAP as well too. So there's these different ideas that are being floated around, but I still think uh, the CPTPP is going to be the, the standard for, for trade for the region. And it goes back a little bit, you know, to the, the point Priscilla made. I'm not sure in the region people are looking for one order. Mm -hmm. In fact, they are, you know, one could say the region is in a bit of a sweet spot rather than a tough spot. Mm -hmm. In the sense that they have multiple things to dock on to, <clears throat> so long as they're meeting national interests. Mm -hmm. For some states, not having to sign up, make a decision about TPP, makes joining docking on the CPTPP even easier. 
because the standards aren't as high. Our sub is largely about tariffs. Mm -hmm. Either India will come on board and decide that it can take care of the China deficit or not to make our sub work. Japan has a physical quality infrastructure which on the ground has far greater investment than, Japanese, than Chinese BRI. Maybe China and Japan will do joint projects. If you're in the region, I'm just trying to place, that's where the heart of my question is. If you're in the region, you look at order, whatever the debate here is in Washington, all of a sudden you have multiple parties and multiple choices of regimes to pick on. And if you are, as I totally agree and have written, been criticized for writing in support of US engagement with ASEAN, that from the ASEAN point of view, as long as the balance of power remains multi, you know, multipolar and people offering things to ASEAN, RCEP, CPTPP, BRI, physical quality infrastructure, maybe the India will do something, maybe Korea southbound policy, maybe Taiwan south, southward policy, however these are framed, you don't want an order. In fact, an exact order is exactly what you don't want. Uh, in a time of yeah, again, if you're in some of these uh, developing countries in South Asia, money from the Japanese, money from the Chinese, now exactly. money from the U.S. Um, I mean, on one hand, if it's if it's about uh, improving, you know, in this case it would be infrastructure, but if that's a way of enhancing you know development and kind of the lives of ordinary people in Asia, I guess that could be a good thing. Countries will play off, you know, the different <coughs> orders perhaps uh, for their own interest. I think the concern, though, is that, um, and, and so I don't think that you have to uh, necessarily pick, uh, pick and choose sides. If the goal is really um, providing regional uh, governance uh, for the region, then, then all these things can be good. And that's the argument of uh, the complex patchwork. Um, but there is this fear. I think it's, it's more on, and it's because we're looking at this from the lens of Washington. There is concern that if China and it takes uh, precedence or dominance in the order that it's going to um, steer uh, regional order in ways that kind of meet its own interests and ambitions, ambitions and they're not that helpful to mm -hmm. other countries. And so this is why you're seeing criticism against China being pointed out in places like Sri Lanka or um, the Myanmar, where these countries are really in debt. And now they there's a lot of, it's not just economic leverage, it's now strategic leverage that China has over these countries. And, um, but, but, but just just to play the string that out, you know, my Sri Lankan friends would say to me, the reason we went with China is because, because of the way in which our war ended, the West mm -hmm. and the US couldn't play, mm -hmm. or didn't play, or chose not to play. So there's a... It's up to us, in some sense, to play. And what I find amongst Asian states all the time is they do a lot of things to reel the U.S. back into the region or to, to keep the U.S., as you said, the most disinterested of all the, because we have no sovereignty claim to the region, right? So when the Philippines tossed us out of bases in the Philippines in the early 90s, Singapore picked up the slack and became, in many ways, a very important strategic partner. So a lot of countries do that. Malaysia does more with us than it did 10 years ago. Indonesia does more with us than it did. Vietnam and, and India, it, it's hard to imagine how far we've come in the last. In other words, there's a constantly shifting dynamic as region. They have agency and autonomy to pick orders and to pick things from these orders now that are being offered by several players, mm -hmm. which before they didn't really have much of a choice. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if if what we're gonna see is this very hybrid kind of order in which regional countries continue to game the system to their benefit. That could be fine, but I think under this modified liberal order, it would still, there should still be some basic ground rules about, uh, and that's what would be my order, it's, it's how, if we say institutional order, it's how the rules, institutions, and norms shape the interaction of states. And um, and I think there has to be some basic ground rules in the way uh, states interact or engage with one another, whether it's through investment or whether it's with security arrangements. And um, so to the extent that it can be open and you can choose, I think that's fine. And that's what I think the modified liberal order is it allows for, it means that the U.S. would have to seek some ground to other, to other actors, even if they're authoritarian, but there are still some basic rebels. And look, even China, 
has benefited immensely from a liberal order, from a trade and openness. It's not like they want uh, the global commons to be closed up as well, too. But there's always this fear, that it's, it's because of this lack of trust that you know, states have with one another that they fear that if, if one country tends to dominate, um, that it's going to be uh, adversarial to that. It's zero sum thinking. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the complex magic is trying to foster more of a positive sum thinking mm -hmm. for. Um, regional cooperation and governance. Priscilla wanted to come in on this point, and sir, I'm sorry, I'm conscious that you sure. had a question, but yes. Just one point of correction Myanmar is not in debt to China. BRI has not taken off yet in Myanmar. They are challenging the Chinese plans, and it's going to be a real test for BRI. Um, they are in debt to Japan because Japan basically bailed them out and got them back in, you know, into the World Bank and so forth when the transition happened in 2010, 2011. So okay. don't, we, don't, don't we, use Myanmar as sure. an example of Chinese indebtedness. There's a country that, which country is it that has the dam that was built and now It wasn't built. It, it wasn't built. Okay. They suspended it. it. You see, you haven't it. been reading <laughs> the news carefully. No. It's suspended. It's still under consideration, but it's not going to okay. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. But there will Thanks be there'll be a dam. Yeah. There'll be some other kind of dams because they need the hydropower, and the Chinese are the logical builders. So mm -hmm. that something will happen there, but it's going to be on Myanmar's terms. It's not a Sri Lanka. Do you think they're going to borrow money from the Chinese to do it? They or? right now they're saying no sovereign debt. Okay. They're saying concessionaires can come in, and the SOEs, the uh, private companies, and so forth can come in, but they're going to bear the debt, not the government. I appreciate your clarifications. Thank you. And, and the one dam that has been built is French. Please, sir, you had a comment or question? Okay, uh, my name is Scott Machu. I'm a PhD student of, of Purple Young. So my You're going to ask a professor. <laughs> 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 you, sir, are a brave graduate student. Please, <laughs> onward you go. So my question is about the U.S. Asia strategy. So today, still, the Asia security architecture is largely defined by the U.S. bilateral organized system. <laughs> And the people in Washington DC still believe that the US privacy in Asia Pacific should be US strategy. So do you believe this US privacy in Asia could coexist with your complex patchwork of institutional building? Yeah, so it's uh, US privacy is really like a security and military term and um it could, but I don't think it's necessary. And, and so if it's gonna be uh I mean, if it's going to cause a strong visceral reaction from other actors, then you may have to rethink it. So I, 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 so I think it's important to have a certain uh, limited uh, pre U.S. presence in Asia. I, that for, that's uh, that has to take. I think that should be uh, that should be there. But whether it's a strategy of primacy, um, in, in that sense, I I may uh, be more on the same page with uh, folks like Steve Wall. Or John Mearsheimer, that you know, the U.S. doesn't need to dominate like, every part of the world. Um, I think, I, and the idea of having multilateral institutions, actually having alliance partnerships, in some ways, is allow it, it allows us to channel some of its, um, you know, rather than taking things on alone, it means relying more on other countries to you know, keep house and, and it's part of the world. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, also, Dr. Yu, a student, and uh, <laughs> oh, I should know. Oh, I first. <laughs> <laughs> and also a senior research fellow at Global Taiwan Institute. Uh, so my question is about the U.S. role in this regional architecture. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard uh, Dr. Ji John Eikenberry say that you know the U.S. president right now, Trump, does not see the value of institutions. Mm -hmm. So the pilot, his words, the pilots flying by buckle up, right? Mm -hmm. So do you, do you agree? Like, do you see that as really like is that your view as well? What you read by U.S. involvement, and if that's the case. Do you see that as just temporary for these few years and it's going to come back later with somebody else in the White House, like Biden or something? Or do you think there's something more enduring about that? Yeah. I mean, I don't think the president really has strong uh, uh, I'm a grasp of really institutions or, or multilateral institutions, but it, it doesn't, I mean, it does matter what he thinks. But if you look at, I think, the agencies, the folks in DOD or NSC, the State Department, I think they do get and understand that there's some importance for institutions. So. Um, I, I agree with Eikenberry's assessment specifically on Trump, like as a person himself, but in terms of the, applying that to administration, you know, I don't, I'm not as concerned. I mean, I, I, 
I can see how in my talk it was construed in a way that you know, the, the whole that Trump has completely rejected alliances and institutions. I don't think that's the case. I think he is very transactional, but the administration itself has uh, maintained uh, uh, rhetorically and in practice, you know, the, you know, they've been saying that alliances are important. They've done things that try to manage alliances and uh, cultivate partnerships through institutions. So that hasn't gone away. I just think, though, that from a from the president's you know, platform, it's just not good to be you know, criticizing alliances out in the open. Um, because if your job is to kind of persuade and to lead other countries, it, not even leading, it's just to persuade. Um, it's, it's not really helping helping you out if, if you're bashing, um, bashing allies. I have a two finger on this Please one. Um, I have two points. Ellen Frost. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Ellen Frost is so um, I, I think that when you look at the different countries of Asia, you'll find that there's, there's a big contrast between the red meat the president throws to his base in Washington mm -hmm. on Twitter and what's actually going on. I keep hearing that there's significant mill mill cooperation um, going on as, as before. Um, the second aspect of this, I, I think I've observed over time that uh, the appointments, the presidential and, um, appointments and just below, for Asia tend to be made by for professionals. I mean, there's a fairly steady record of, of, of people in the assistant secretaries of state and defense who really do know something about Asia and are um, you know, not being rewarded for contributing to a campaign or anything like that. I think they play fast and loose with other regions maybe, but not. But we haven't had an assistant secretary of state for the entire well, that's true. Yeah. administration. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> for Asia. Yeah, there, there will a, be, there is hopefully defense. within the next couple well, of weeks, nice. General Stowell will be yes. on board. There isn't just that position. I think right. they take yeah. appointments. Or no, no, you're serious. right. But you're I, generally, I, you're right. But generally right. But I think Ellen raises a question that sort of undergirds this whole discussion, very useful discussion, which is, you know, there's the rhetoric. And, I mean, I, I'm conscious that we had a big debate about joining Asian institutions through a through the George W. Bush administration, H.W. Bush administration, H.W., George W., I mean, we didn't get here in, this wasn't an immaculate membership in Asian regional institutions. We got here through a series of interagency inter and intergovernmental debates. And there was a debate about signing the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, I'm always mindful that if you, if you take a list of multilateral institutions of which our country, the United States anyways, is a member, Asian institutions are one that we tend to join later after they're formed. TAC, we're, we're not the first signatory, we're a late signatory. EAS, we joined with Russia in 2012, years after it was established. We've been very mixed about ARF. Um, we joined TPP after the initiation of the four countries that joined, joined the negotiations initially. Ellen, you'll correct me, Brunei, New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile. Yes, the original correct. four, the, the original P4. four, so the P four that started TPP. In other words, be, sometimes here's where we were, our discussion earlier about history comes in. Because our approach to Asia post forty five has been singularly bilateral for a set of historical mm -hmm. circumstances, conflict, the way in which World War Two ended, the difference in Europe, etc. One could make the case that in some ways we're a latecomer to institutionalized architecture in the region. And there was one period under the pivot in which we tried to shape that institutionalism, remember? Mm -hmm. And Asia pushed back. ASEAN pushed back. They said, please, keep your legacy issues. We want to keep our issues. Don't try to change the issues we should deal with. Please don't try to make EAS the steering group for everything else. So that dynamic, as a, as a, in terms of policy, I think we have to really come to a place where we're able to manage the dynamism between being a member and not shaping what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. And that goes for both bilaterals as well as the regional project, precisely because it's a more contested Asia. Mm -hmm. There are more players, more options. Mm -hmm. So it requires, a, I think, a different finesse than perhaps we've traditionally been used to. Yeah, th that's a terrific observation. And I, I mean, I'll agree that the US has never really been in the forefront of <clears throat> Uh, aside from establishing the core bilateral line system, it hasn't been the form of shaping 
He's talking about our institutions. They tend to come back to the game. Right. There's the Obama administration that did a lot, I think, sure. on the regional front because it was part of the, the pivot. Right. There was a whole diplomatic component. Sure. Just when we joined Sign Tech, joined EAS, um, assigned ASEAN as a, 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 an ambassador, an ambassador level position. We were the first. Secretary. Yeah. Um, I can see how ASEANs might be leery and saying that, you know, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you know, this isn't. This isn't something for the U.S. to just come into it and, and reshape, but I do think that ASEAN appreciated that the U.S. was becoming more engaged within the region, and that was the concern because they felt that um, there were concerns about China, and they were wondering if the U.S. was mm-hmm. going to um, retreat or not. So, on one hand, they didn't want uh, the U.S. to come in and you know, kind of take over ASEAN, but at the same time, they welcomed U.S. engagement. And so, I think what's important is that. You know, Navigating, having dialogue with uh, Southeast Asian countries and other players within Asia as well too, um, and and again, this is where I think the re- the, the patchwork idea of overlapping institutions is a good one because we have the bilateral alliance to deal with security, but it's fine for the U.S. to work with other uh, countries in various multilateral settings to address other regional um, problems, whether they're economic security, you know, non-traditional security mm-hmm. issues. Is there anyone else? Because we have a couple minutes left, but if not, otherwise I'm going to make advertisements before we <laughs> return to thank Andrew. I would not be uh, doing my role. Look, as I mentioned, uh, let me give you specifics. Um, May 7th, Tuesday, from 12 to 1.30, uh, Dr. Angela Stent, uh, Director, Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, and Professor at the Foreign Service School at Georgetown, uh, will talk about her new book, Putin's World, and she'll focus... It, the book is subtitled Russia Against the West and with the Rest, but she'll focus on the Asia or East Asian dimensions of Putin's world. And so I hope you'll join us for that. If you're not on our um, uh, listserv for uh, events, publications, etc., please consider uh, uh, being on that list. Uh, there's a sign up sheet outside, and we'd be happy to help you. We cannot put you on the list um, by our regulations, but if you want to leave a card or fill in a form, be happy to put you on the list. And with that, I want to, I'm waiting already for your new book, because yeah. I know you're started already working. This is a very prodigious and productive scholar. But What's the subject? On, uh, civil, uh, international influences on civil, civil society. society. Wow. And democracy, civil society yeah. and democracy. Civil society and democracy. Nice manageable book. Nice <laughs> he only picks the small, manageable topics. Yeah, it took me 10 years to do this yeah. one, so I'll be... Uh, <laughs> well, I'll be you'll know where to find us. Okay. I may not be here, but you... <laughs> well, 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 definitely, someone will welcome you here. Listen, Andrew, a delight to have you. And you, a delight to launch your book, and glad that the East West Center has been associated with the Stanford University Press Series, and we'll look forward to engaging with you many times again. And thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you.